Your podcast listeners crave an amazing audio experience. Give them what they want by tapping into a 20-year audio pro, Chris Curran's Production Secrets. Learn simple microphone tricks for studio quality sound, how to avoid amateur mistakes that bleed into distracting background noise, and discover pro editing methods for clear, engaging discussions. Welcome to the Podcasting Secrets Show, where successful creators share their best stories, secrets, and strategies. I'm your host, Nathan Gwilliam. Hello, incurable creators. In this episode, I'm joined by Chris Curran. Chris is the founder and lead instructor of Podcast Engineering School. He's been an audio engineer in the music business, started in the 90s. Um, He's been podcasting since 2012. He's even produced podcasts uh, for names like Forbes, Dun & Bradstreet, and Johnson & Johnson. He's been running Podcast um, Engineering School since 2016, and he is a frequent speaker at Podcast Movement and PodFest. And today we're going to be talking a lot about professional audio production. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. Thank you. So can you start off by sharing with us some of your journey in podcasting? I, as you mentioned in the intro, I've been an audio engineer since the early 90s. And I, I think it was the fall of 2011, I found out about podcasts. I had never, I didn't know what they were. And when, as soon as I found out what podcasts were, I was like, this is my jam. Like I'm, I'm an audio, like I'm so overqualified for this. It's crazy, you know, in terms of audio production. So I got into it, and actually in 2012, I I ended up opening a physical podcast studio in New Jersey, which I had for three years. Uh, that that was a whole wonderful experience, you know, producing shows for local people, being really involved in the Chamber of Commerce. That was great. And then um, I guess just to finish the arc, I moved to Colorado in 2015, and I started producing podcasts remotely for these, you know, bigger type clients that you talked about, and. Yeah, I love producing podcasts and it, uh, I don't actually produce for clients anymore. These days I'm focused on my school, which is, you mentioned it, Podcast Engineering School, where I teach people professional podcast production. So I train people to be, you know, top tier, you know, 1% uh, audio producers in the world for podcasts, like real professionals, not like just some kid in a basement, you know, editing with audacity or something, right? So that's been my journey. Yeah. And I love, I love the whole industry of podcasting. So yeah. All right. Let's go back to a couple of things you said here. You talked about um, working in the music industry first and then making this transition to podcasting and how, how you were incredibly qualified once podcasting came around. Um, if people didn't know about pod- podcast engineering school, how do people normally become qualified to be a podcast producer, podcast production engineer? Well, anyone can do it. I mean, you can go to watch YouTube videos on how to do anything, but there's a lot, you know, there's an art to it, right? So you can go through the motions, but if you don't sort of understand the nuances and if the biggest thing is training your ears, right? You have to know what you're hearing and you have to know how to fix the the audio issues that come up. So, so normal people without attending any training that, you know, you can learn a lot from YouTube for sure. Um, And it really just comes down to your hearing. Like you have to sort of get in the habit of zoning in on the sound. And and once you do, uh, you'll hear all kinds of stuff. Like you'll hear things you never heard before. In fact, you'll listen to a lot of podcasts that are almost unlistenable because of background noise or nasty plosives or drastic changes in volume. You know, one minute you're getting your ears blown out of your head. And then the next minute you're like, I can't hear it. I, they're, they're whispering. And so there's so many things. Um, there, there are, there is a lot to learn, but uh, some of the things I just mentioned are the most important. And if you, if, if you don't make those big mistakes that I just mentioned, you're like, you're in the top 90% of podcasts for, or the top 10% of podcasts for sure. It's amazing how, how often those that are untrained just, just miss and ignore those kinds of things. So this training of your ears and training how to be do professional high-end podcast production. You obviously provide that service at the Podcast Engineering School. Can you tell me how you guys do it so much better than these old school ways that other people might do it, like watching the YouTube videos? Well, so watching YouTube videos, anybody can do, right? And you can learn a lot, but the problem is you don't know what to learn and when to learn it. 
right? You're just sort of poking around in the dark. So my school is just tailored from, we, we start with the fundamentals of audio and we go all the way through everything until the very end, until publishing and all that stuff. So, you know, and I, because I've been producing podcasts so long, I know what people need to learn, right? And, and I know what they don't really need to focus on either. So that's really all it is. Um, and it just, you know, again, it's not, it's not rocket science, but again, it's like, I could learn, if I wanted to learn sewing, I mean, I could go online, I could learn, do stuff and whatever, but like nothing beats sitting with a person who knows, who, who's like teaching you one-on-one -on -one and, and who's been doing it forever. And just probably within one hour with that expert, you can learn more than you would have in like years on YouTube type thing, right? How many episodes do you think you've helped produce over the years? In more than a decade, you've been doing this. Yeah, my numbers aren't staggering. Some people say thousands, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands. I actually don't know. I mean, I'm definitely over a thousand, but it, you know, I, so the way I ran my podcast production company was I, because of my background, I was the expensive option, right? I was the, uh, the white club service that these big companies want, right? When the big companies hire podcast engineers or producers, they want a person who knows what they're doing who can produce great audio, and who just takes care of everything. And that includes recording. When I produce podcasts for clients, the bigger clients, I was there during the recording. I would, I would make sure the host arrives into the, uh, into the studio, and then the guest arrives. I would sound check the guest. I would take care of everything. The host wouldn't even have to press record. So I would literally take care of everything, and these big companies absolutely love that. That's what they want. So I charged a lot. So my, that was a long way of saying that I never had that many clients. I, the most clients I ever had at one time was probably like seven. So Yeah, but you had some pretty big high-end clients that were looking for some pretty high-level services. Right. And, you, and I charged a lot. So for good reason. So that's yeah. it. Found your niche high into the market and got paid really well to do it. Um, as you did that... What is the most embarrassing thing that you've, you've gone through in producing an episode? And how'd you get through it? With the client stuff, I just, I just remembered this. There was a time when, and this, is, this only happened once with clients uh, or ever, but uh, I published one of their episodes and I think there was like 45 seconds of silence at the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> which is, I mean, that's sort of the, like, the worst things you can do because what happens? People download the episode, they hit play, and they're like checking their volume and they're hearing everything. So then they started messaging the host who was my client. And then, so she messaged me, she said, there's, there's silence at the beginning. So of course I went in really quick and fixed that. Um, but that's for client stuff for my own stuff. Uh, there's been one or two times, I think one or two, I know of one time when I forgot to hit record and we, we started the show and it was great. And it was when I had my studio in New Jersey, we were all sitting together and it was like a great 10 minutes. And then after 10 minutes, I looked down and it wasn't recording. And I was like, oh no. So then I stopped it. And then of course we started again. And of course, as soon as we started recording again, they all made fun of me. Like they, they were, they were <laughs> bashing me pretty good, but it was in good fun. Um, but I, everyone does that at least once you forget to hit record. It's just Yeah. I've made that mistake before too. Okay, so those two mistakes, um, in not hitting record and, and having, having some silence at the beginning, how have you changed your production process to help prevent those and other mistakes like that? Well, I didn't have to change anything. I mean, those were just s silly mistakes. Like, for, for forgetting to hit record, like, you always, the way I always do it is, okay, I hit record on the main recording, and I hit record on the backup recorder, and, like, I make it a big sort of a big deal. Like, okay, I'm hitting record here and I'm hitting record here. And then, okay, now we're ready to go. Let's go. Um, I don't know why that day. I just, I just didn't do that. I was probably distracted from the guys who were, you know, cause we were just having fun joking around. Yeah. Some kind of conversation. And then as, as far as leaving silence at the beginning, again, that's, that's something that I, I literally don't even know how it happened. So th that never happens. So I didn't really have to change anything. Right. For that. What is the hardest, most challenging thing you've had to go through in your journey and how did you get through it? 
I guess sometimes editing certain episodes uh, because so my clients, right? I would have them buy a decent microphone setup, right? So they sounded good and I would teach them microphone technique. So they, you know, I would teach them how to sound like a good podcaster, right? But of course, guests, guests don't know anything, right? They don't have any, they don't have a microphone. They don't have anything. They don't know anything and they shouldn't because they're just people, regular people. So a lot of times when guests show up, they sound terrible. So I would sound check them and this and that, but sometimes they're in a noisy environment. Sometimes um, they, um, every, um, um, every, <laughs> um, sometimes, um, um, it, it, you know, it just, so editing people like, by the way, I did that on purpose, everyone, <laughs> just so you know, but some people are really hard to edit. Uh, and the other thing that's, that's really hard is, is when someone is in a noisy environment and they move around a lot. So even if they have a microphone, they'll, they'll, they'll move around a lot and they'll, then, then they'll come real close to the mic. And like, at times they're loud, at times they're not so loud. And of course you can use compression to even out that disparity, but compression raises the noise floor. So if it's noisy and you use compression, it's, it's just, so, so with certain guests and certain people, I've had to just wrestle with this audio in post-production just to get it to sound presentable. So, yeah. Okay. So you've mentioned numerous times here, the audio quality and, and things that mistakes that people have made that have, have caused less than optimal audio quality. Would, would you say that one of your greatest secrets to a, a great podcast is, is really good audio quality? Yeah, I mean, it's not so much a secret and, and, and you don't have to have really good audio quality. You know, Dave Jackson said this, says this all the time, you know, good enough is good enough. And it kind of is like, and that's why in the, when I first came into this podcast, when I first started my school teaching professional podcast production, there were a bunch of people in the industry who thought I was just crazy. Like you don't need, you don't have to spend that much attention on audio production and it's like, well, my school's not for podcasters, it's for producers. So yes, we do, first of all. But a lot of people think you can just get a decent microphone and that's it, you're done. Uh, and that's kind of true. So let me put it this way to everyone listening. It's not a big secret. There, there are, it's not a big secret to have good audio. Um, that sentence didn't sound right. There's no big secret. Here's what you have to do. Get a decent microphone. Put it about four inches or maybe six inches from your mouth and be in an environment where there's not a lot of background noise. It should be, you should be in a quiet place and you should have a decent microphone and you stay close to the mic and you don't move around and face different directions and crazy and you don't make a bunch of noise in your studio. You know, you just, you be quiet. You're in a studio, you're recording. So be quiet, be in a quiet room. Have a decent mic and stay close to the mic. There's your formula. You talked about some of the mistakes here, like having a lot of ambient noise. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen um, with people in their audio quality? Yeah, I mean, I just mentioned a lot of them. Uh, Being too maybe far some from other the ones mic are, or turning around, yeah. Yeah, that's called mic technique. When you're good mic technique is when you stay close to the mic and you stay facing the same direction and you just stay there. That's called good microphone technique. Um, you can see, if you're watching the video on this, I have a, a pop filter here in front of my mic, so that stops the plosives. That's another thing, people. Um, that's another way that audio sounds bad is if there are a bunch of plosives. So if you're listening, you, you're watching. Yeah. And when you're talking about plosives, just for someone that might not know, that's that sounds was, like a P sound. Oh, you're going to explain that. Okay. I was, I, yeah, it's like a P sound. So what I want everyone to do is ho hold... Hold one of your hands like two inches away from your mouth. Hold hold a hand up right to your mouth and say pizza pie. Pizza pie. And you feel that wind hitting your hand. Well, that wind, if you direct that wind directly into a microphone, that wind overwhelms the diaphragm of the mic and, and it causes this big low frequency thud. It's like, that's called a plosive and they're nasty. 
sometimes they're nasty. So what you have to do is just use a pop filter or a windscreen, those little foam things you see people put on top of their mic. So that's all you got to do. Use one of those or you, 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 instead of using a pop filter or a windscreen, you can sort of angle the mic in from the side and sort of talk past the microphone. And so that that wind goes, it doesn't go into the mic, it goes past the microphone and that's it. Then you'll never have plosives in your life. But um, what else? Uh, another, another thing is sibilance. I mean, th these are a little more technical, but sibilance is something you remove in post-production. And that's when the S sounds, the sibilance and T's and S's. Some people, they're, it's a combination of the voice and the microphone. Some combinations of voice and microphone exacerbate that those high frequencies between like five and seven kilohertz. And it just is so sharp and it'll hurt your ears. And so what you can do in post-production is use what we call a de it, it, it And it reduces that sibilance in that specific frequency range. And it's like, so if someone has nasty sibilance, that's also difficult to listen to. So, I mean, these are sort of more professional things I'm talking yep. about, but sometimes you hear somebody and it's like they, they have saliva in their mouth, you know, that's moving and making noise as they're talking. What is that called? And how do you, how do you prevent that? Like just the mouth noises of like saliva and yeah. like um, the, uh, we mouth clicks or mouth noise. Uh, that usually happens when someone's really close to the mic. And or mouth clicks are are uh, something. And I'm not talking about um, the these the um um I I don't do it well. But some people, you know, they do that. They have that uh, habit of I f I forget. I'm I'm even forgetting on what that's called. But anyway, that's just annoying. But what I'm talking about mouth clicks. I'm talking about little tiny little tiny clicks from the mouth, like when people. It's it's hard to explain, but that can set and and some people have that. Uh, th there's a there's a I can't think of the name of it. It's a condition people have where if they hear people chewing or if they hear people's mouths and saliva, they they get like freaked out. M misophonia, I think it's called or something. Anyway, mouth clicks are something. Anyway, we, the, there's some really awesome software, really expensive audio software that can actually remove stuff like mouth clicks and stuff. Lip smacks, that's what they are. Uh, it's called a lip smack. Talk By the way, about oh, go lip ahead. smacking is just a nasty habit that any you can cure yourself of easily. Just start noticing every time you do it. Yeah. And then once you do it, you're going to be like, oh, I just lip smacked. And then you'll do it again. You'll be like, oh, I just lip smacked. And I guarantee probably within a few days, you're just not going to lip smack anymore because you're noticing it and you just don't do it. And that's why it's so important to listen to our episodes before we publish them and not just have an editor listen to them so we can hear what we're doing. It helps us learn from it. Okay. Talk to me about a pop filter versus a windscreen. Which do you prefer and why? Uh, it doesn't matter. They're both good. Whatever fits on your, whatever uh, is appropriate for your mic. Like right now I'm using, um, I'm using an RE20 microphone, which is a big, long microphone. And so to put a piece of foam on it looks a little strange. So I just use, uh, I just use what I'm using now. And so it, but it just depends. If you have a regular handheld microphone, a smaller handheld microphone, you can just put the windscreen on top of it. It doesn't really matter. You just need a little foam between your 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 mouth and the mic. I always feel like I have to have the foam covering it. I'm always afraid of sound bouncing. So I used to have a windscreen that was between me and the mic. But some of my sound would bounce and come to it from a different direction. But maybe then it's a far enough distance that the pops don't matter. Is that not a relevant yeah. issue? Yeah. So those those the 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 air coming out of your mouth that causes the plosive, it's it it dissipates pretty quickly. Burst of air is not gonna bounce off a wall and come back into the mic at all. It's just your mouth to the mic, that's the that's where the plosive happens. And so you don't have to worry about anything bouncing or coming back. What should we be looking for in a microphone to get the audio quality that we need? What kind of microphone should we, should be on the top of our list? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a bunch of good mics. You know, the most famous one now is the Shure SM7B. That's the one Joe Rogan uses and everyone uses now. It's a great mic. I think it's around 400 bucks maybe. 
but it's a great mic. The one I have is the RE20. This is uh, uh, one of the greatest it, or most used broadcasting microphones for the last 60 year, 50 years. Uh, th I think it's about $450. But you can get a, a, a $100 microphone. You can get a, a, you know, a Shure SM58 or an ATR2100 or something like that. Uh, that usually it's around a hundred bucks, maybe a hundred fifty bucks. Yeah, that's fine. That Shure MV7, by the way, I bought two of them recently, and I have them in my studio upstairs. I recently got in a snowboarding accident, and I can't go upstairs, so I'm using one of my old mics. But that that Shure mic you can even buy on uh, eBay for under two hundred dollars now. The MV7, and I agree, it's a phenomenal mic. Yeah, the MV7 is good. It's different from the SM7B. The SM7B is still markedly better also the mv7 the shore mv7 that you're talking about i've tested it and i found when you because that microphone has two outputs one is digital you can plug usb right into the computer the other one is an xlr output the xlr output sounds markedly worse than if you just go usb Interesting. into the computer yeah okay well i've been doing the usb but i didn't realize it was a better sound so that's really good to know yeah so the reason that MV7 is better than, uh, what was the name of the other one that you said, the other Shure mic? The, uh, the SM58. Yeah, the SM58. So, so as I researched those two, trying to find the best one, um, what everyone said is the MV7 was the best mic for an imperfect environment. So if you, if you have a perfect recording studio, you know, with, with all of the sound blocked, then that higher, higher end mic is better. But it, if you're recording in your house and, and you don't have a perfect production environment, that may be where the MV7 is a, a better option. Would you agree with that? Okay, so so much of the sound comes from how close you are to the microphone, the nature of the space you're in, you know, and also your, the quality of the person's voice. So here's one thing I'll tell you about microphones. People will say, oh, the you, we've heard it for years. Oh, the Blue Yeti is a great microphone. Or... The, the Heil PR40, that's the best microphone. And it's like, there's no such thing as the best microphone because the sound you end up with, there's two factors that influence the sound of your recording. One is your voice. The other one is the microphone. So I could use a certain microphone and my voice sounds good. You could jump on this same microphone and your voice doesn't sound as good. So maybe an SM7B is, sounds better on you than it does on me. So just telling people, oh, this is the best mic, buy that one. It's not quite correct. Now, if you buy an SM7B or RE20, you're going to be fine. It'll, you'll still sound good either way. But my point is, it depends a lot on the person's voice too. And also the, the proximity. And so, the environment. Yeah. Um, the environment. I, I started off with a Blue Yeti. And it seems like that's what podcasters are supposed to do. It picked up so much ambient noise. It just, it really frustrated me. And so I quickly moved away from that. Uh, maybe I didn't have the settings right. Maybe I didn't know what I was doing. But is that a common problem with the Blue Yeti? Totally. It's a condenser microphone, which is a much more uh, sensitive microphone. Um, and, and look, if you're in a vocal booth or a good studio, the Blue Yeti sounds great. And the Blue Yeti is a decent mic overall. But uh, it's a condenser microphone, which are much more sensitive and so what all the mics we've been talking about are dynamic microphones. Dynamic microphones pick up less of the room noise and, and all that because um, that's just the nature of the, the diaphragm inside the mic. Talk to me about temporary recording environments. Let's say I'm going to a conference or a trade show and, and um, I, I want to record some people that are there, but I, I can't use my perfect recording studio environment. I mean, my recording studio is not perfect, but I can't use my recording studio at home. I've got to just do something temporary with people walking around. What's the best way to do that? Yeah. I mean, if you're walking around, you can just, uh, there are some microphones you can buy, which actually have the recorders inside the mic. So you just hold it like a handheld and you can just point it at people and talk, or you can just get a regular mic and run an XLR cable into a little recorder. Maybe that's in your pocket. Um, those, those are typically the ways to do it. And again, the thing the most important thing in that, in those scenarios is to get the microphone close to people's mouths. Right. So especially if you're in a loud convention hall, 
Like you can't just have the mic down near your waist and pointing it sort of at the person. Like that's not enough. You got to stick the mic like almost, it feels like you're sticking it right in their face, but it's, you know, maybe right. six inches from their mouth. Is there a specific mic you would recommend for that environment? Uh, I think Rode makes one called the Rode Reporter. It's an omnidirectional, longer mic. Um, I, the, I haven't really done much of this scenario, uh, but the Yellow Tech mics are the ones I was talking about that it records right in the mic. Uh, and I, I've always wanted to buy a Yellow Tech, but I, I haven't had the use case for it, so I haven't bought it, but they're, they're really great mics. How about those dual lav mics where you have one cord that plugs in and then you have a lav connected to you and a lav connected to your guest you're interviewing? Would you recommend something like that? I mean, I, I guess that's bringing everything into one audio stream so you don't have multiple tracks. What, what would be the pros and cons there? Yeah, um, I don't know about wiring it that way, but you just reminded me of Rode, I think the Rode Go mics. I think Rode has these Go mics. They're like little clip-on mics. You can clip them on, and it's it connects like Bluetooth, yep. to a recorder, and people use that for video. That's probably a good uh, solution for any on-location stuff, or even you know on-location videos. Let's talk headphones or earbuds. Um, it seems like a lot of people that I'm I'm doing interviews now, they're going with the in-ear earbuds, wireless. Um, what what's your feeling? A earbud versus a headphone? Do you have a preference? Yeah, I haven't tried a lot of the earbuds or the you know what AirPods are the Apple ones. I haven't tried a lot of those, so I don't really know how they sound. What it comes down to is you have to know what you're hearing. So I wouldn't be surprised if there are people who have cheap earbuds and they can they listen to everything on their cheap earbuds and then they produce their podcasts with the same cheap earbuds. It can sound great because they're used to it. Um, other people like me, I mean, I'm wearing pretty decent studio headphones, probably costs around, I don't know, 250 bucks. Uh, but again, it's, and of course they sound better than earbuds probably, but ultimately in terms of audio production, your goal is to provide, to produce a piece of audio that's gonna, that a listener can listen to and have a good listening experience, right? That's literally, yeah, that's what you're trying to provide. That's the only purpose of audio production. So if, you, if you're if you used to the way something sounds in your earbuds or your even maybe you have cheap headphones, over-the-ear headphones, it doesn't matter. Uh, but one way to check everything is to obviously play, you know, produce audio on whatever you have and then listen to it uh, in your car, listen to it through your TV, have other people listen to it. Like you can sort of check, you know, s sound check it in different places and, and you'll hear different things like in your car. It'll be like, oh, my God, there's way too much low end or something. Right. You can dial in your own headphones or earbuds. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. Thanks for all the value you you uh, shared with our audience. If they enjoyed this episode like I did and they want to learn more about your products, your services, your podcast engineering school, what are the best ways for them to do that? Yeah, just the website, podcastengineeringschool.com. Uh, you can reach out to me through my website. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Nathan. Here are my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, get close to the microphone, such as four to six inches away, and avoid moving around or turning your head while recording to ensure good microphone technique. Number two, record in a quiet environment without background noise for optimal sound quality. Number three, use a pop filter to avoid plosives. Those are the popping P sounds that can overwhelm the microphone. Number four, learn to train your ears to listen for and eliminate problems like background noise, uneven audio levels, sibilance, and mouth noises. Number five, choose a dynamic microphone like the Shure SM7B or Electro Voice RE20 for radio quality sound that minimizes ambient noise. Number six, pay attention to room acoustics and soundproofing your recording space to prevent audio issues. Number seven, quality headphones and earbuds allow you to monitor your recording accurately and produce better sound. Number eight, getting feedback from listeners when checking mixes on different speakers helps to ensure your podcast will sound great for your audience. If you're looking for a great all-in-one podcasting platform with 35 integrated modules, you can get a free trial at podup.com. Thank you for joining us for this episode. 
I wish you success in creating high-quality audio content for your listeners.